thank you, everybody. I'm extremely honored and, and humbled by, by being here. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an amazing experience. And um, my name is Tobias. I, I, I'm the team captain of, of FIDES, which actually is a combination of ScanTrust. Uh, we provide anti-counterfeiting solutions. And I run their office in, uh, in Shanghai, in China. Um, and BigchainDB, who are um, a blockchain infrastructure company who've just released a version two of their software that supports uh, Tendermint. Um, and together, we've, um, we thought long and hard about what is the real challenge that we have in front of us. Um, and the real challenge, in our opinion, uh, is that there needs to be a transformation of incentives. There needs to be a change in mindset uh, with the rights holders as to what is their social responsibility in this world of counterfeiting. If you go into a shop at this moment, if with supermarket, uh, shoe shop, uh, electronics store, etc., and you try to find a way of authenticating the products that you see there, then you might have a 1%, 2%, depending on the category, chance of finding a product that has that um, authentication on it. And why is that? I think the reason is that consumers do not have a voice that they can use to the brands to tell them you need to do something about this counterfeiting problem. And the reason that counterfeiting is hard for the rights holders is that there's an economic misalignment. They are not incentivized enough. Uh, they have a lot of challenges. They have to manage their spend. Do they spend on social media? Do they spend on uh, marketing? Um, or do they spend on anti-counterfeiting? It's very hard to quantify. It's very hard. It's a whack-a-mole game for a lot of them. It's very difficult to reach any type of real traction. Uh, if they close one factory down, another one opens up, etc. So the solution is really, in our opinion, that we need to leverage the consumer and make them the hero in this story. You, as an individual consumer, can take action against counterfeiting. Yeah. You can get more transparency, you get more authenticity, you can stop these illegal supply chains that have pollution, child labor, um, a lot of other issues um, that they contribute to organized crime, for example, or terrorism. So we built an ecosystem where brands can put unique identifiers on a product. And these are identifier agnostic. It can be any type of anti-counterfeiting solution that you can uniquely, uniquely identify per product. And on the good chain, you'll be able to add impact points to each of these identifiers. And these impact points can then be retrieved or collected by consumers who can provide a proof of ownership and scan these products and then say, OK, I have now impact points in my wallet. And I can start to do something with these impact points. And this is where the loop cycles back to the brands. The brands will have a way of pushing causes onto good chain where Consumers can then say, OK, I like to donate. I bought water. I would like to donate to a water well in Africa. I bought a piece of chocolate. I can now contribute directly to the farmers of that, of that chocolate. I have a choice as a consumer now to use these impact points and make a difference. Okay. So what we're actually doing is we're leveraging this con consumer engagement, this real engagement with a, with a customer, to what brands are willing to pay for. Because it's an economic incentive for the brand to collect customer data. This is what they want to pay for. And if they get an economic incentive to put identifiers on the packaging, they will do it because it will then give them a direct benefit. And the other benefit, which is for the social good, which is everything gets lifted up by the rising tide, consumers will start to demand these identifiers on other packaging. So um, what we see also is that in this discussion we had with the experts is that um, of course, you have customs who can process 1% of the goods at this moment of roughly everything that comes through the supply chain. And they told us if these testing certification and inspection companies would give us more transparency in what they're doing at point of manufacturing, and we could somehow have an aggregation of these unique identifiers into higher level units that would also be blockchain enabled, then we could green lane these products. We could push them through the supply chain faster and we can put them through customs faster. So we also see these unique identifiers in, in collaboration with other um, um, startups that we, that we spoke to, like ReCheck or Seal. We can use their blockchains as well as further proof that upstream in the supply chain, there have been some checks and balances so that when the, the package hit, hits customs, they can already clear them through faster. And that would free up capacity for them to manage other parts of the supply chain and look at other uh, more suspect packages. So the good chain is really about incentivizing. So the incentiv incentivizing for the consumers is know the uh, provenance of your goods, um, 
fight counterfeits, but get these impact points. Um, the benefit for the brand owners is that they are rebuilding trust. They're having a real engagement with the consumers where they can actually have a dialogue and where they can say, we also care about the same things that you care for. But of course, in the background, it's about consumer data and it's about securing the supply chain. That is the added benefit of doing this. The other actor in the inspection companies, they are already inspecting packages. They are already going to factories, ch checking out the location, seeing if there's any uh, sus sustainability issues or uh, labor issues or things like that. They are already doing organics checks, uh, rainforest certifications, all these other things. Um, and they're finding fakes. They're finding fakes. But they have no way now at this moment to really get an incentive for reporting that. Yeah. So if we use these impact points that get issued to each of these products as a currency to then go into the brand and to say, hey, this is something that you need to pay attention to. And as an inspection company, I can now be rewarded for doing this. So it would be crowdsourcing for these pre-checks before they hit customs and before they hit logistics operators or e-retailers. Um, the last part is customs. I already talked about green laning. This was for us really the learning experiment, uh, the learning experience. Um, we're not new to this game. We have already been at ScanTrust. Uh, we've been a member of the um, IPM Connect program, which works together with the uh, International Customs Organization. Um, and our, our founder is a member of the OECD Task Force Against Illicit Trade for the last few years. So we are very aware of what's happening in these markets, but we feel that customs has their hands tied behind their back in a certain, in a certain way. Um, it's very difficult to get any good workflow process with the rights holders, for example. Uh, we learned in the last few days that sometimes right holders don't even come and pick up and destroy the goods because it's too expensive for them to do this. Um, so we were really made aware of the challenges of, of customs, and that was for us you know, a, a, big, a, big, a big benefit of being here and kind of transformational in our thought. But it further solidified the message that it needs to start from the bottom. It needs to be a rising tide of consumer, um, of consumer advocacy. And as soon as a few of the big brands will start to do this, and as soon as the big brands are willing to put authentication in the hands of the consumer, then we'll see everything in the supply chain more transparent, more secure, more safe, etc. cetera. Um, I don't need more time. I still have <laughs> two and a half minutes. I think we can start with the questions maybe. So thank you for your attention Woo! again. I'm very humbled. And, yeah. Yeah. Grant, thanks very much, Tobias. Um, well, with two minutes to go, we can add that definitely on the Q&A, both uh, with the grand jury and also with you, ladies and gentlemen, in the audience who might have a critical question. May I now invite the members of the grand jury to come back up, all four of them, and... Um, wait, wait, I still have to... I think there was questions first, right? No. Oh, okay. No. Q&A by the members of the grand jury. Right. So you will be grilled. Oh, this is the grilling part. Yeah, this is okay. the grilling part, right. hopefully. <laughs> you know, let's make it snazzy. <laughs> All right. Who starts? Hello? Yes. Ah, very good. Well, congratulations. Should I start? Yeah. You have a question? I'll get closer. If that's okay. Yeah. Yes. Congratulations for uh, making the finals. Thank Quick you. question. You said it's based on incentives. Uh, what about the situation where consumers have uh, misaligned incentives? Uh, sometimes consumers always aren't with us in this fight. Sometimes consumers just want an inexpensive uh, Lukaku or Harry Kane jersey. Uh, and they, uh, they don't care if it's uh, authentic or not. And so how does that then, uh, how does your solution account for uh, when consumers have different incentives uh, from the brand owners and retailers? Yeah, we, we had that question a few times during the, the separate sessions that we had with, with the different teams. Uh, I think the answer is that it need, there needs to be a, um, a whistleblower mechanism built into this ecosystem. So you can say, okay, I as a, I as a consumer like cheap shoes and I, I, you know, I buy a pair of Nike for $10. I'm pretty, I'm pretty aware of the fact that these are, are going to be counterfeit. Um, but if I can incentivize other consumers to be whistleblowers and to say, there's a Nike shoe there that's $10, that's something, there's not something fishy happening here, then you could have something else that would, um, that would counterbalance that. That would be my first answer. The second point would be that um, blockchain really made us rethink the, um, the aspects of trust, reputation, and staking. 
And if you would say that, for example, there's a staking mechanism built into the supply chain where uh, suppliers who are selling something have a stake in the fact that their products are authentic, you could then take away that stake if there's uh, a dispute that gets, that gets related to this supplier. So you could have a, a penalty mechanism built in as well, other than an incentive. So if you have them on, I, I'm sure Amazon has this as well on their platform, reputation management is staking. It's built into the blockchain. It's really the number one thing that's driving this for a lot of parties, this dispute management and, and, and reputation management. Yeah. Okay. Um, so th the notion that you're going to build a bunch of additional capital into the chain uh, as a way of basically paying for disputes, right? I mean, it seems like the underlying mechanism is a consumer raises a dispute that the goods that they have are fake. And if the goods prove to be fake, they get some kind of payout on that basis. Right? Um, how do you anticipate handling the kind of additional capital requirements, right? If everybody has to stake a bunch of value equal to some fraction of the goods that they have in the system, who's going to pay for that capital being tied up? I mean, surely this is going to raise the costs for consumers, you know, appreciably if you've got, you know, 5, 10, 20 percent of the working capital in the system is tied up in bonds. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the concept here would be a utility token. It wouldn't be a uh, security in that sense, uh, initially, when we talk about consumer impact points and incentivizing that. Mm -hmm. um, but as soon as you have a massive amount of goods being staked on this chain, mm -hmm. you're talking about real products. You're talking potentially with the identifiers that we have, you're talking about bottles of Coca-Cola, you're talking about sure, Unilever sure. chocolates, you're talking about any type of thing that has an economic real value in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, if you then put on top of that a pledge, it doesn't mean that automatically your cash is then tied into it. It's a, it's a promise as you, as, you, as you wish on top of it. Yeah. And there's market, there's market mechanisms there that we need to put in place. Obviously, it's not an existing chain at the moment. Mm -hmm. We need to put a market mechanism in there so that the blockchain itself regulates this and ha has a way of setting the market terms of doing this. So what is the, what is the value of an impact point? I, I have no idea. Uh, what is it to the brand? What is it to the retailer? What is it to the logistics supplier or provider? Uh, what kind of incentives would, would, be, would be converted or, or transacted for doing an inspection? Mm -hmm. Obviously, if I'm in the supermarket at Carrefour and I'm scanning a, a bottle of Coca-Cola as a retailer, mm -hmm. that has less value than when I scan a fake Nike shoe somewhere in a, in a, in a shop somewhere and I alert the authorities for that. Right? Yeah. So th yeah. th these incentives need to be aligned, and that's a complex problem, and it's not something that we can predetermine or deterministically say, okay, that's what it's going to be. Mm. Yeah. Yes, so uh, Tobias, good morning, and congratulations morning. for bringing Fides to the finalist level already. You. So uh, you mentioned that customs would get alerts. How would you go about doing that? Would uh, the customs authorities in the member states, in the uh, national authorities in general, have a node, be connected to your blockchain? How would that work practically? Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. So um, currently we saw an EDB system that was, that's being put in place at this moment, an enforcement database, which I think is a huge step forward in giving some kind of transparency, not only to the rights holders, but potentially to other trusted parties uh, interfacing with the with the customs authorities, uh, what we saw there was a little bit unclear, and I think that's still a, a missing part of the strategy: is how to make that API really open, how to make it so that uh, different parties who are somehow certified can get access to it. Uh, and secondly, um, and we we're missing this in this whole discussion, we we're missing the uh, TIC companies, testing, inspection, and certification. Um, they take a huge background role at this moment in the global supply chain, SGS, Bureau of Veritas, those type of companies. They're doing millions of inspections every day. And why is that data not ending up at the customs? Because that can make a huge difference in green laning and trying to get these goods through the supply chain faster. So if goods get ordered by Amazon and they get inspected at the port and at the factory, um, it's in the interest of Amazon and it's in the interest of the customs to get this through as fast as possible. So if there could be another incentivization, maybe also using these impact points to have a way of staking these claims from the TIC companies, that could be an economic incentive for them to send this data to customs and get it through faster. That was just a thought and you know, obviously it requires massive collaboration to still make that work, but it's, it's an idea. Yeah. Okay. Pretty good, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I know nothing about 
technology and blockchains and things like that. So can you explain to me in two words um, what is the added value of blockchain compared to another technology that maybe already exists already? We talked about the, the, the EDB, uh, which is a classical database. So what is blockchain adding to, to your solution? That's the first question. And then the second one is um, if you win, how do you see the next 100 days? Oh, okay. That's a good question. Um, yeah, so there's, there's obviously an incredible number of stakeholders in this, in this chain of fighting counterfeits, right? Um, and w centralized systems are really good if there's, a, if there's one authority and everybody agrees to follow that authority. But in this case, it's fake. You don't really know who to trust in the supply chain. Do I trust the logistics operator or the retailer or the manufacturer or the inspection company? So you need more of a web of trust and you just need one system to tell you this is, this is the truth. And blockchain has built in it already staking and reputation management and incentivization. And you know, um, it, 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 it pays for people, in, uh, entities running the nodes and keeping the chain secure. Uh, and I think that adds a much better foundation than centralized system, which are always political and always corporate. And there's always a lot of money to be made up by companies up front to build it, where you kind of st still don't know what the outcome will be in the end. Uh, to answer your second question, um, our objective is to get 100 million products secured in the first quarter of 2019. That's the objective, with the help of hopefully um, EU IPO, um, potentially some consumer rights organizations, get them involved, and of course, um, a, brand, a brand owner or rights holder to, to be part of that, of that incentive. Yeah. That answers your second question, I think. Yeah. A lot of different companies are working on many solutions, some based on blockchain, some not based on blockchain. Would your solution be interoperable with these other solutions, or would it be competing uh, to become the primary standard? Yeah, I, um, and, and, and you know, Alibaba is working on something. Um, I, I know you, you, Amazon is working on something. Um, you're obviously challenged by the FBA suppliers who, uh, who are kind of causing havoc sometimes in the markets and that you have to. So um, yes, we definitely want to make it interoperable. And as I said in the, in the beginning, we have a secure identifier that's uh, copy proof. Um, it, it contains crypto cryptographic information built into the printing process, and we, we sell these codes. Um, but we're, we're code agnostic. Good chain is code agnostic in the sense that if, if Amazon has a code, you could pledge impact points related to those codes as well. And um, you know, if, if another supplier who provides NFC chips wants to be on this, this blockchain, as long as they can be an oracle that provides um, the, the minting of the, the identifiers as well as the proof of observation or proof of purchase, then they can be on this chain. Yeah. Uh, could you could you say a little more about the printing technology? Like, what is a what is the cryptographic printing technology process? Yeah. Tell, yeah. Me, tell me how that works. Yeah. Well, we have our founder in in the audience, Justin Justin Picard. Can you stand up, or are you standing up already? Yeah. Um, <laughs> he uh, he holds currently about twenty patents related to image encryption and uh, uh, technology. If we can put the, the code back up on the screen, is that possible? Uh, someone? No. Okay. I, I can show it to you, but it's not very impressive. I can show you afterwards. Um, it's, it's, it's based on the, on the fact that uh, when you print an image, a digital image, uh, there's information loss. Um, the printing is an imperfect process. Sure. So, so when uh, a pixel uh, gets printed, it bleeds into the substrate. It bleeds into the paper, uh -huh. and there is something called dot gain, which you, which you know probably if your printer is set to dark, you get this smudgy picture. Okay, the same happens intentionally with our code. So in the center of this code, you see a secure graphic, this little block. Some companies use it for a logo in the center of the QR code. Uh, we use this area to put a code that has actually four cryptographic keys in that code that are optimized for information loss. So when it gets printed, the information level goes to 100, the original file, to about 60 when it's printed. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's a smudging that happens. And what, what that means is that if I'm a counterfeiter, I can make a electron microscope scan of this image, and I can make a perfect image of that code. But when I print it, the dot gain will happen again. 
And there's currently no printing technology out there that prevents this dot game from happening. So it's like a photocopy and of a photocopy of a photocopy. Right. Photocopy. And then so what you see is on the on already the first copy they make, the information level goes from 60 typically to 25 percent. Mm -hmm. And optics on modern phones at this moment can detect this information loss. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really just purely ink on paper. Uh, it's it's probably a, a thousand times cheaper than an NFC chip. Okay. And so it can really be used to protect everything from your from your shoes to basically a, a bottle of water. Got it. Yeah. And, th and those unique IDs are what are being stored on the blockchain? Yeah. So the, when, when the minting process happens, you need to have some type of either uh, ERC721 or some other representation there to, to, to make it uh, uh, unique. Yeah. At this stage, right. I would like uh, to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to stay up here uh, because you might want to chip in. but. This is now your chance uh, to put critical or supportive questions or just uh, comments and remarks. Ratke will uh, come to you. He is, just for once, my, my assistant. Never had such a great looking young assistant before in my life. <laughs> uh, and uh, I know this is sexism, but we're fortunately in Europe and we're not in the US. So, uh, Ratke, you will forgive me. I hope you forgive me. And ladies and gentlemen, it's up to you putting your questions uh, to Tobias, um, and he will hopefully answer them. Any questions from you? If not, oh, yeah. Can you, can you stand up? Caleb. Yeah, I will stand up. So, uh, a great show. Thank you very much for that. My question is, um, I'm not in there, and I'm a logistics uh, provider, so customs, tax suit, or, or the member states, we want to know what I am doing about this problem of counterfeiting or stopping it at the origin. Would I have access to your solution so when you, the shipment you shows up, you that I can it. stop it at the origin instead of first bringing it to Europe and, and create a problem here? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And um, maybe I wasn't clear enough, enough about it, but this, this change should give you an incentive to, to put people on your team as inspectors to inspect these codes. So it would pay for itself. It would pay for your inspect to add additional inspectors to your team to, to observe these, these goods and to add further proof that the supply chain has been, has been, uh, has been untampered. Right? Um, it would be best if you would have a way of proving that observation in a, in a way that's you know, secure. Um, but I think you as KLM have a tremendous reputation. Um, and as such, the value of your observation would be extremely high in this chain. And therefore, you would be rewarded with more impact points from the brand owner or from anybody in, 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 in the chain who's, who's, who's relying on that information. Yeah. We still have uh, time for more questions uh, from uh, maybe the co-creators, uh, uh, other teams. Yeah, just uh, uh, first say your name and where you, where, uh, what kind of team you are from. Yes, uh, John Redder from Hyper42. Uh, question, uh, how do you prevent, more or less, that good chain will be the trusted third party we all want to basically get rid of with a blockchain solution? Good one. So, I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly. How do we prevent this from just being another third party, right? Yeah. So, uh, like I said, an inspection company is basically uh, a provider of proof. A logistic company would be a provider of proof on the chain, and they would be staking their reputation based on, based on their observations. So, as such, the chain would, would, be, would be regulating itself. Um, I, you know, there's, there's, we talk a lot about inter disintermediation, right? We say, okay, we have to kind of like... But you can do that with a digital process, but you cannot do that with a physical process. There's always a moment where the counterfeiter can take the goods and replace them with a fake. So as such, you have to have inspections throughout the supply chain that are real people and that are doing real inspections. Even though you can automate something with IoT devices and you know, cameras and maybe AI observing the images and things like that. But at this moment, every step in the supply chain has real people opening up the packages and seeing what's inside of them and scanning them, etc. And that work needs to somehow be increased. And it can only increase if there is an economic incentive that comes from the brand and, and in effect from the consumer because they're in the end paying for everything. If there's no economic incentive for that to happen, it will just won't happen and there will be no change. 
So I think that's, that's the message of this. And, and you're absolutely right. It should not be just like, oh, it's Scantrust doing this. No, it should be an independent blockchain that, that, that runs by itself and it has enough intelligence built into the, the, the smart contracts that it can regulate that mass mechanism. Yeah. Any more questions from your side? Yes, I think, Radha, on uh, your left, yes. there is a gentleman. Just, just to add up on this question, ha have you figured out a way to distribute your nodes? Is there a new node distribution plan and vision where you basically guarantee yeah. that it is distributed like it should be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we are working with BigchainDB on that. Uh, BigchainDB has just recently uh, being selected as the, the, the foundation for the Ocean Protocol, which is a, a, a information sharing token. Uh, we're working with them now as the, part, the partner for technology. Um, their version two now has uh, Tendermint support, which is, which is very important for transaction speeds. Um, but um, what's important to, to know is that we're building an open source ecosystem. So what's in, what, what, we, what I just showed earlier on the, uh, on the consumer information sharing, Obviously, you would want to keep that off-chain because that's not GDPR compliant. Okay. Um, so the incentivization, the economy would be on the blockchain. Having that information for the brands would be off-chain. And we want to make an ecosystem where there's open source tools for doing that. There's information gateways. Okay. Um, you know, we have been talking to the unchained people who are, uh, who, are, who are building such gateways. We've been talking to ReCheck as well. So there's been a lot of co-creation already happening during this blockathon that, that, that will help with that. Okay. Yeah. We have a question here. Your name and team? Uh, Nicola from... Oh, oh, yeah, thanks. I will hold it for you. Uh, Nicola from Pirate Bester. First of all, uh, congratulations to Tobias for your work and uh, in all of your team and wonderful presentation. And uh, as UX designer of uh, my team, I, of course, I take particular care of the user part of, uh, of this part. And you, t you told us that the screen trust can put potentially from the bottles of Coca-Cola to the most expensive goods. So it means that theoretically uh, our users need to scan tones of code uh, uh, per day potentially uh, each time that they are buying something. And do you think that, I mean, time is a really important part of our life, really important value. Uh, do you really think that introducing this new way of behaving on the users doesn't add the risk of saying, okay, maybe this uh, project is starting well. Uh, people are really enticing by, by the visions, by uh, how cool potentially this could be, but little by little lose like the, the attraction that they had first and, and starting not to scan uh, after a while. Yeah, but uh, it's a very good question. And um, I think, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's an ecosystem, right? So if we have the luxury problem of thousands of products in the shelves all being scannable with, uh, with, with impact points, with good chain points, then we've obviously succeeded on a, on a level that would be fantastic. Um, and at that point, we would start to work with retailers who would then in the store scan these codes for us. We would work with Amazon if they, they, the goods get ordered that the impact points are automatically distributed. Um, so there's ways around this, this time problem that you're mentioning. Um, but you have to remember it's, it's you know, getting scan rates on products. And we, we know this because we already have millions of products in the market with our, with our code on it. Water filters, infant formula, um, yoga mats. Uh, and these products have a scan rate of a couple of percent. Okay? That means that you're never going to get 98%. Nobody has time for that, right? But that couple of percent is enough to give you data points that are way higher than any market research company can give you. Mm. So this data is extremely valuable for the brands. And you're talking about a couple of US dollars per, per observation that, that gets made, uh, per profile or per you know, information element that they receive. So for a brand to say, okay, from those few dollars per information uh, engagement that I have with my consumer, allocating a, you know, 10, 20, 30 cents, or even maybe $1 to a good cause, does not matter. And as such, we think that will have the snowball effect to make it work. Two minutes to go. So one okay. quick question from the lady in the middle and a quick answer, unless yeah, there is one more urgent question from the panel. Good morning. I'm Yulia Isopoulou from Greek Customs. Uh, I would like to know, mm -hmm. uh, taking into account that the core principle for us is access in advance control where required, what is the added value for customs? Thank you very much for that precise question. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, the, the added value is that we incentivize uh, the TIC companies, the testing, inspection, and certification companies, to when they go out and inspect situations at, at, at a brand, at a factory, or at a location, uh, and they see certain things that they don't trust. For example, they, they observe the loading dock, and they say, well, this loading dock is not secure. We've observed anomalies. We've seen you know, th strange things happening near the loading dock. They, they can alert customs and say, hey, this, this, uh, this, uh, this chain seems to be broken. There seems to be an issue in the upstream of providing the goods into customs. Um, but they are currently not incentivized to do this. Why would they? What is, what is the economic reason for them to do this? Right? So again, it comes down to the incentive. This is a money problem. This is a money problem. That, it's a social problem that, w that is augmented by a money problem, by an incentive problem. So you could imagine that the TIC companies would have a lot to gain from reporting this data to customs and as a way of pre preventing work for you or directing your efforts to the right, to the right shipment. This would be extremely valuable. Thank you so much. And with 10 seconds to go, okay. I think uh, we should wrap up this uh, part of the Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, everybody here Thanks in the everyone. audience, for the great questions.